I've called this video you know, Confessions of a Racial Profiler because I'm confessing that I, in my youth, became a racial profiler. And I want to talk about how it happened because I think it's important to understand how it happens. I worked at a job in Center City, Philadelphia for basically 16 years. I started when I was 16 years old. I was still in high school. I was a junior in high school. And I worked there all through high school, through uh, college, through graduate school, until I was 32. So I spent 16 years working in Center City, Philadelphia. And it was at a, a multi-level parking garage, not one of these self-park deals. This was a place where you dropped off your car and uh, the car jockey, or as we used to call ourselves, stationary automotive attendants, would take your car and park it. And it was in Center City, and it was kind of grimy. It was really hot in the summer. It was bitterly cold in the winter because you're dealing with all this concrete. And uh, it was a rough job. We worked hard. I mean, there were days I'd, I'd work 11, sometimes 12 hours. Uh, when I started working Sundays, I used to work a 14-hour day, and I was 16. Uh, it was a very diverse workforce. Uh, when I started, there were so few white people there that uh, the black guys used to call me whitey until they, they got to know my name. Hey, Whitey, you know, come over here. Hey, Whitey, move that car. You know, hey, Whitey, do this. Hey, Whitey, do that. And, uh, you know, I, I was, I just didn't work with African-American men. I worked for them. I mean, one of the two managers I worked for was uh, Charlie Green number one, because there was also a Charlie Green number two. And, uh, you know, he was the manager. He basically looked out for me. And then later on, when I moved up the chain, I worked for another manager, Bill Johnson, who was uh, one of his city supervisors. And I answered to him. How did I start racially profiling? Well, it was pretty simple. If you think about it, during the 16 years I worked there, not straight, there was one point I took off for about a year and a half and worked somewhere else, but then I came back. But during those 16 years, I witnessed I made a list years ago. I don't have it anymore. Something like three dozen crimes witnessed, not hear, hear about. I mean, these are things that I saw that happened while I was there. And that's a lot of crimes. It's almost considering it was 16 years. I worked there about 15 years. But uh, that's, you know, better than two a year. Uh, on the, the one extreme or not very extreme, there was people, you know, passing counterfeit $20, $50 bills. I saw that. Uh, we had holdups. We had uh, uh, car thefts. And on the we had an arson. And then the other extreme, one night, my assistant manager got shot in the head. Uh, so, I mean, this this is the kind of job I was working, you know, when, when I was a 16-year-old uh, kid. And over the years... And by the time I was 19, I was an assistant manager and I was during my shift, I was running the place. And by the end, I was uh, one of the uh, city supervisors we would roam around the city at night. We had like two dozen places and make sure everything was OK. And I learned a lot of things in this you know, urban environment that I worked in. And one of them was how to profile. Now, looking at those 36 crimes. If you look at them and you look at who were the perpetrators in those crimes, a certain pattern develops. For example, of the three dozen crimes, how many of them were committed by Native Americans, male or female? None. How many were committed by South Asians, Muslims, Hindus, male or female? None. How many were committed by East Asians, male or female? None. How many were committed by white people, male or female? None. How many were committed by Latinas? None. How many were committed by Latinos? One. The arson effort. How many were committed by African-American females? None. How many were committed by young African-American males? All the rest. African males over the age of maybe 35? No. So it wasn't long before I was racially profiling. Once I was a manager and I was responsible for what went on there, 
You know, I was responsible if we were held up. I was responsible if somebody got away with the money. I was responsible if somebody snuck into the garage and went out with a car, which happened often. One time I was almost run over by a guy trying to get out of a lot with a car when I tried to stop him. You start to profile. I mean, if I was sitting at the garage and I saw a, a, a Hindu woman with a dot on her forehead and is wearing a you know Hindu uh, Indian style clothing, and she was hanging around for some reason that I I, I didn't suspect her. If I saw a uh, Latina woman hanging around, I didn't I didn't really worry much about them. If I saw an African American female, I didn't worry about them. I mean, there were times I got into arguments with African-American females. I had them call me nasty stuff or say nasty things to me. But I never, I never in the 16 years I worked down there, ever saw an African-American female commit a crime. Nothing. So what did I do? By the time, by the time I was 19 and I was a, you know, a shift manager, I kept uh, what in nautical terms you would call a weather eye uh, on uh, young African Americans seem to be hanging around for no particular reason because they were the most likely people to do something from my experience. And I might add from everybody else's experience. I mean, the things I learned down there, I just didn't learn from white people. I learned from uh, African American men. They told me who to look out for. They knew who, who, was, who would steal the cars, who would, you know, the guy, my assistant manager was shot in the head was a black male. He was a black man. He was shot in the head by another black man. You think he wasn't suspicious? You know, th this was the reality of, uh, of working down there. It's not, I don't, if so, if, if you want to consider me a, a racist because I racially profiled people, there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, I've been called a racist for the last three years. It does, doesn't really bother me anymore. It should bother me. It used to bother me when you know, 10 years ago, I had a student accuse me of racism. And my heart almost stopped. I felt sick in the pit of my stomach. But anymore, it's like, you know, what else is new? I get called a racist on uh, Facebook or Twitter, you know, sometimes once a week, sometimes more than once a week. But, you know, I learned a lot down there. And it wasn't, you know, just white people telling me to look out for this or look out for that. You know, the the African-American men I worked with would teach me more. I learned, you know, how if you get in an argument with anybody, what do you do? I mean, I, I was 16 years old, and this, and this is, you know, people talk about, you know, parents tell you about this or that. I, I was being told by an African-American man, if you get into an argument with anybody, it doesn't matter what color they are. This is what you do. You know, you stand on the balls of your feet so you can go in any direction you need to. You never stand flat-footed, and you don't look people in the eye. Now, you know, I was always taught when you're talking to somebody to look them in the eye. But they always thought, no, no, you don't do that, Michael. You don't do that, Wadey. Don't look them in the eye. Eyes ain't going to kill you. What they would tell me was, you washed their hands. Because that's where the trouble's going to come from. So there I was, a 16-year-old, you know, still in high school, junior in high school, Catholic private high school, being taught on how to argue with people. Balls of your feet, watch their hands. Because that's, that's where they're going to get you. Eyes never killed anybody. And I don't know if, if I argue like that anymore. I remember I got in a, an argument once when I taught at ECU 20 years ago or so. And I know I was arguing with a guy and he kept saying, look at me. Look, can't you look me in the eye? He was a white professor. And I was watching his hands. I mean, it was just, I, I, I had done that for 16 years. It was just, you know, instinct. These are just learned behaviors that you pick up from the environment you're in. And that's how I learned to racially profile. It's, it's really that simple. Now, if you want to call, again, you want to call it racism, go ahead. But when you see, you know, three dozen crimes committed, when you see, you know, your assistant manager get shot in the head, and did I become a racial profiler? Yes. I didn't pay attention to the Latinas or the black women or the Native Americans or the South Asians or the East Asians or the white people loitering around the garage. I kept an eye, what in nautical terms you call a weather eye. And they call it a weather eye for a reason, because if you're on a sailing ship, you know, there are dangers of enemy ships coming. There are dangers of fire. And the other danger is the weather. 
And if, if the weather is threatening and if the weather is going to damage your ship, it's going to come from the direction of the wind. So one of the lookouts, if you're one of the lookouts, what you have to do is you keep a weather eye. That means you look in the direction of the weather. If the wind's blowing from the northeast, you watch the northeast and you watch the horizon because you can see those gales when they come and they come quick. A lot of times at sea, it looks like you can see forever, but sometimes you may not see more than two nautical miles. And if the wind's blowing at 60 knots in this gale, it's going to be there in three minutes from the time you see it. You don't have a lot of time to give a warning and have the ship get ready, make sure all the ropes are tight, shorten sail, whatever you need to do. So if you're a lookout, you learn to keep a weather eye. You're profiling. You profile because you know if there's a danger to the ship, it's likely to come from a certain direction. It's not going to come, if it's coming from the northeast, it's not going to, if the wind's coming from the northeast, no weather is going to creep up your from behind or from uh, the port side or it's going to come from the northeast. That's the weather eye. And that's what, what profiling is, basically. Learning to appreciate where the threat's likely to come from and keeping an eye out for it. And that's what I learned to do. What's the most likely direction that the danger is coming from? And when 35 of 36 crimes that you witness are committed by young African-American males, those are the people that you start looking at. Now, that's how I grew up. I grew up basically racially profiling people. And, you know, I confess to that. You can th think of it what you want. You can make of it what you want. But that's, that's the reality of life. And we all do it. That's the way our brains work. We're not wired. We do, every decision we make isn't a computer-like decision where we run through, you know, the odds and the tables and everything else. That's not, we don't work that way. The human mind works on belief systems. That's why religion is so prevalent around the world. One religion or another, it doesn't really matter. Even the political atheist left today has their own belief system. We have belief systems. That's how the human mind works. That's how we deal with the complexities of life. And we do this all the time. It's how our minds work. And our minds lend themselves to profiling. And there's really nothing we can do with that unless we can change the human mind. And I don't think you can do that. You may get people to say that their minds have been changed, but that doesn't mean you're really going to change them. So that, that's you know my confession about being a racial profiler. And like I said, make of it what you will. If you like this video or any other video, you know, please uh, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, uh, hit the notification button so you'll know when I uh, upload uh, additional new videos. And uh, thanks for watching. I appreciate it much. And for the time being, again, to uh, quote Dennis Miller, I'm out of here. This is the environment I worked in. And did I become a racial profiler? Yes. I didn't pay attention to the Latinas or the black women or the Native Americans or the South Asians or the East Asians or the white people loitering around the garage. I kept an eye, what a nautical term should call a weather eye. And they call it a weather eye for a reason, because if you're on a sailing ship, you know, there are dangers of enemy ships coming. There are dangers of fire. And the other danger is the weather. And if, if the weather is threatening, and if the weather is going to damage your ship, it's going to come from the direction of the wind. So one of the lookouts, if you're one of the lookouts, what you have to do is you keep a weather eye. That means you look in the direction of the weather. If the wind's blowing from the northeast, you watch the northeast. And you watch the horizon. Because you can see those gales when they come. And they come quick. A lot of times at sea, it looks like you can see forever, but sometimes you may not see more than two nautical miles. And if the wind's blowing at 60 knots in this gale, it's going to be there in three minutes from the time you see it. You don't have a lot of time to give a warning and have the ship get ready, make sure all the ropes are tight, shorten sail, whatever you need to do. So if you're a lookout, you learn to keep a weather eye. You're profiling. You profile because you know if there's a danger to the ship, it's likely to come from a certain direction. It's not going to come, if it's coming from the northeast, it's not going to, the wind's coming from the northeast, no weather's going to creep up your, 
from behind or from uh, the port side or it's going to come from the northeast. That's the weather eye. And that's what, what profiling is, basically. Learning to appreciate where the threat's likely to come from and keeping an eye out for it. And that's what I learned to do. I didn't know all about nautical terms in those days, but it was the same thing. What's the most likely direction that the danger is coming from? And when 35 of 36 crimes that you witness are committed by young African-American males, those are the people that you start looking at. Now, I'm not a policeman, so I'm not profiling. I'm not go grabbing them. I'm not searching them. I'm not, you know, arresting them. I'm not doing anything to them. I'm just watching them. But that's how I grew up. I grew up basically racially profiling people. And, you know, I confess to that. You can th think of it what you want. You can make of it what you want. But that's, that's the reality of life. And that's the reality that, that people are in. It's the same thing that, you know, African-Americans do with fearing the police. I mean, they fear the police because they have a reason to fear the police. You know, the police treat them badly. Sometimes the police, as we recently saw with George Floyd, will kill you, even if you don't deserve it. You know, what did he do? He passed a $20 counterfeit bill. That's not, you know, he, he surrendered. He was polite. He was on the ground. He was handcuffed. I mean, he's hardly threatening. Why do you need to kill the guy? So that's why they fear the police. That's profiling. And we all do it. That's the way our brains work. We're not wired. We, every decision we make isn't a computer-like decision where we run through, you know, the odds and the tables and everything else. That's not, we don't work that way. The human mind works on belief systems. That's why religion is so prevalent around the world. One religion or another, it doesn't really matter. Even the political atheist left today has their own belief system. We have belief systems. That's how the human mind works. That's how we deal with the complexities of life. Otherwise, we'd get out of work and decide, you know, what are the odds that it's a good thing to take a shower today or not? You know, there were, when I used to live, there were like three different ways I could go to work. Which way is the safest way today? What, are, what time is it? How are the trains running? You don't sit there and do these things. You just wake up, you take a shower, you hop in the car and you drive to work. And you have a belief system. This is the best best way to go. This is the safest way to go. Avoid the, the route where the railroad tracks. You might get caught. And we do this all the time. It's how our minds work. And our minds lend themselves to profiling. And there's really nothing we can do with that unless we can change the human mind. And I don't think you can do that. You may get people to say that their minds have been changed, but that doesn't mean you're really going to change them. So that, that's... You know, my confession about being a racial profiler and, like I said, make of it what you will. If you like this video or any other video, you know, please uh, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, uh, hit the notification button so you'll know when I uh, upload uh, additional new videos. And uh, thanks for watching. I appreciate it much. And for the time being... Again, to uh, quote Dennis Miller, I'm out of here.